Kemper Arena in Kansas City offered a new setting for the Final Four in a familiar city. Kansas City's Municipal Auditorium had hosted nine of the first 26 championships. Now, in its 50th year, the tournament provided a golden opportunity for the Oklahoma Sooners, the Duke Blue Devils, the Arizona Wildcats, or the Kansas Jayhawks to make basketball history. Going to Kansas City, the 1988 NCAA Final Four Highlight Show is brought to you by Rawlings Sporting Goods Company, maker of the official ball of the 1988 NCAA Basketball Championships. The opening semifinal was a rematch, favored Duke, 28 and six, against Kansas, which had lost 11 games during the regular season, including one to Duke in overtime. Larry Brown's Jayhawks had also lost to Mike Krzyzewski's Blue Devils in the semifinals of the 1986 Final Four. But Kansas had one edge in playing only 40 miles from its own campus, and another in Danny Manning, whose layup made the score 7-0. Duke went scoreless for more than four minutes into the game. The Atlantic Coast Conference champions missed their first five shots, failed to score their first nine trips down the court. Kansas, led by the All-America Manning, was as hot as Duke was not. Scooter Berry's nifty pass paid off when Manning tipped in the rebound, 9-0. Milt Newton, a reserve until senior Archie Marshall was injured during the regular season, was almost as impressive as Manning in the first half. Newton made five of his first seven shots, and his driving layup four and a half minutes into the game stretched Kansas' lead to a stunning 14-0. With almost five minutes gone, Duke finally scored. Sophomore Ala Abdelnabi's hook shot ending the drive. Let's go, Blue Devil! Let's go, Duke! Let's go, Duke! Manning had suffered through the most frustrating game of his college career in the 1986 semifinal, Held by Duke to four points then, but barely five minutes into this game, Manning jammed home his fifth and six points. Hey! After Kansas widened its lead to 18-2, Duke's All-America Danny Ferry, who had missed his first three shots, hit two baskets in a row, cutting the Jayhawk lead to 12 points. But if Duke had hopes of an early comeback, Kansas dashed them with a surge of six straight points. The last two on Chris Piper's drive, giving the Jayhawks an 18-point lead, their biggest of the game. But Duke wasn't about to give up. The Blue Devils made six of their next seven shots, including three driving layups in a row for Kevin Strickland, the senior guard. Duke fans, who had seen their team rally from far behind to beat Kansas in their regular season meeting, sensed another comeback when a few seconds before halftime, Quinn Snyder rolled in a layup that cut the deficit to 11 points, hardly an insurmountable margin. After all, in the East Final, Duke had come from 10 points down to eliminate Temple, the country's top-ranked team. But the second half started like the first. Kevin Pritchard's drive triggered a burst of eight straight Kansas points, and Duke missed its first eight shots after the intermission. Milt Newton, despite being guarded by Billy King, Duke's defensive wizard, was well on his way to a 20-point performance. And if that wasn't enough to dismay Blue Devil fans, Danny Manning, who led both teams with six block shots and 10 rebounds, was on his way to a 25-point game. Duke's Danny Ferry scored six straight points to reduce a 16-point deficit to 10 with 12 minutes to play. With eight minutes to go, the difference was down to five points, and the Blue Devils and their fans were up. Newton quieted the Duke crowd momentarily with a dazzling behind-the-back pass that set up a driving layup for Chris Piper. But Kansas still couldn't relax, not with a mere seven-point lead with five minutes left. Duke's defense tightened. Kansas poise wavered, and the Blue Devils seemed to be on the brink of turning the game around. Quinn Snyder set up Kevin Strickland for a fast break duck that reduced the Jayhawks' lead once again to five points. Then Danny Ferry, with a steal and a breakaway, lifted Duke to within three points of Kansas with four minutes still on the clock. 
Now it was Kevin Pritchard's turn for heroics. The Jayhawks sophomore guard tossing up an improbable shot that managed to fall through. Kansas again led by five. But with two and a half minutes to go, Duke once more sliced the margin to three. Snyder connecting from the baseline. But the Blue Devils never got any closer. They had a chance when Pritchard missed a layup, but Manning rose to the occasion as he had all game, taking the rebound for the basket that destroyed Duke's comeback. Kansas made seven foul shots in the last two minutes and wrapped up a 66-59 victory that propelled Larry Brown in his third Final Four in only seven years of college coaching into the championship game for the second time. Only two months early, Kansas was 12 and eight, but now Brown was one victory from his first NCAA title and Kansas second. Some people suspected that the second semifinal, Arizona ranked second in the country against Oklahoma ranked fourth, was really the championship game, the critical matchup in the final four. Oklahoma coached by Billy Tubbs and Arizona coached by Lute Olson had never before met in basketball, but each knew the other was explosive. Oklahoma had averaged 104 points a game. But Oklahoma fizzled in the opening minutes, missing five of its first six shots. Only Harvey Grant's jumper saved the Sooners from being shut out in the first four and a half minutes as Arizona spurted to a 9-2 lead. Anthony Cook started the Arizona surge, connecting on his first three shots. All-America Sean Elliott kept the surge going. He made his first five shots. The Wildcat fans thought they couldn't miss. But then Oklahoma and its pressing defense took command. Mookie Blaylock's steal led to a layup for Dave Seeger. And while Sooner fans were still savoring Mookie's nifty theft, Ricky Grace came up with another. The Sooners, after missing eight of their first 10 shots, made seven of their next 10. The Oklahoma pressure, though, didn't always work. When Sean Elliott beat the press for a driving layup eight minutes into the game, Arizona regained the lead 13 to 12. Coach Olsen celebrated, but his Wildcats never led again. Eight and a half minutes into the game, Stacy King's jumper moved Oklahoma ahead for good. King had 12 points in the first half, matching Elliott's output for Arizona. Neither team was very effective from long range. Only seven and a half minutes remained in the first half when Oklahoma's Seeger hit the game's first three-pointer, widening his team's lead to six points. Arizona suddenly lost its shooting touch. After making nine of its first 14 shots, the Wildcats missed 12 of the next 14. Arizona's sharpshooting guard, Steve Kerr, who'd made more than half of his three-point shots all season, tried six in the first half and missed five of them. Oklahoma, on the other hand, sank seven of nine shots in a six-minute stretch. Andre Wiley hit two of the baskets, and the Sooners raced to a 14-point lead. Arizona's decline mirrored the fortunes of its star. John Elliott, who couldn't miss at the beginning, missed his last six shots of the first half. Sooner fans were ecstatic. Arizona, which had come into the Final Four with a 15-game winning streak, which had won its four tournament games by an average of 27 points, was down by 12 at the half. Oklahoma, the Big Eight champions, hoped the second half would be just like the first. But Lute Olson told his Arizona players it had to be different. Three minutes into the second half, Olson's message got through. Arizona ran off 13 points to Oklahoma's four, sinking four straight shots in a minute and a half. Judd Bushler came off the Wildcat bench and sank the first two shots he took, the second at the end of this dazzling display of teamwork. Arizona was clearly on its way back, and when Elliott ended a seven-minute personal drought with a driving dunk, the Wildcats drew within three points, 51-48, with almost 13 minutes left in the game. But that was as close as Arizona would get. Oklahoma scored seven of the next eight points, and when Harvey Grant caught fire, he scored eight of his 21 points in a five-minute spurt.
the Sooners open some breathing room. Starting with Grant's shot, the Sooners outscored Arizona 12 to three during the next three minutes and were never again seriously threatened. Mookie Blaylock, the quick-handed guard, alertly contributed to the Oklahoma rally. Coach Tubbs was delighted, even though, for a change, he knew his team was not going to reach the 100 mark. With one minute and 41 seconds remaining in the game, Arizona drew within eight points on Anthony Cook's jumper. But that was the Wildcats' last gasp. Oklahoma promptly took the ball down court. And when Andre Wiley, who came off the bench to score 11 points, made the layup, that opened the gap to 10 points. Oklahoma fans rejoiced. Only three months after the Sooners played for the National Football Championship in the Orange Bowl, they were going to play for the National Basketball Championship in Kansas City. Billy Tubbs, in his first Final Four, was going to the final game, hoping that his team would fare better than the football team. His Sooners had every reason to dance. They'd faced Kansas twice during the regular season and had beaten them twice by eight points each time. For the first time ever, two Big Eight teams were in the NCAA championship game. And with the game being played in the heart of Big Eight country, Kemper Arena was packed with partisans, most of them rooting for Kansas. But if the Jayhawks had the edge off the court, the Sooners certainly seemed to have the edge on. Larry Brown's Kansas team had no national ranking at the end of the regular season, and no team had ever lost 11 games and won the national championship. From the opening tip-off, it took Oklahoma precisely six seconds to score, even faster than its usual pace. Mookie Blaylock hitting on a jump shot. It took Kansas 30 seconds to get even. Danny Manning picking up right where he left off against Duke. The tone of the first half was set. The first six shots the teams took, four by Kansas, went in. Kevin Pritchard made the first three shots he took, all jumpers. Milt Newton, who blocked two Oklahoma shots in the half, was equally as impressive at the offensive end. With a fine pass from Pritchard, Newton was on his way to a perfect 5 for 5 first half. But Newton was hardly the only master marksman. Kansas almost unbelievably made 20 of its first 24 shots, 83%, yet couldn't pull away from Oklahoma. The Sooners' Dave Seeger took eight three-point shots in the first half and made six of them. Nine times before the intermission, the lead changed hands. Seven times the score was tied. The pace the play was stunning. Pritchard Steele set up this Kansas basket. A remarkable driving, twisting, spinning maneuver by Newton. The difference between the two teams was never more than six points. It grew to five for the first time when Clint Normore, a football player who wasn't even on the Kansas roster at the start of the season, drove in for his first postseason basket. Oklahoma shooting cooled off. During one five-minute stretch, the Sooners missed more shots than Kansas missed during the entire first half. But still, the Sooners trail by only two points after Stacy King turned a layup into a three-point play. Oklahoma fans hoped it would be just a matter of time until their superior athletes wore down Kansas. But Manning was more than a match for the Sooners' manpower. The six-foot, ten-inch senior was awesome. Four steals in the first half, seven rebounds, 14 points, and this assist, setting up Clint Normore's second postseason basket. Neither Larry Brown nor anyone else was accustomed to heroics from Normore. He joined the team only after assorted injuries and academic difficulties had decimated the roster. Kansas managed to hold the lead for seven straight minutes until, with eight and a half minutes left of the half, Blaylock's three-pointer tied the score at 33. But then the unlikeliest of heroes came through again, Normore, who had not scored even one point in the Jayhawks' five previous postseason games, pumped in a three-pointer, giving him a total of seven points in six minutes. But Oklahoma then scored six straight points, 
The Sooner Stacy King, who was accustomed to scoring, came up with a steal and a driving dunk that gave Oklahoma a three-point lead, its biggest of the half, 39-36. Dave Seeger scored the next nine Oklahoma points. He scored them in a three-minute spurt when he took three three-point shots and made all of them. The third gave the Sooners a three-point lead with under two minutes remaining before the intermission. Kansas bounced right back, scored the next five points, two of them when Manning, his long arms everywhere, stole the ball, loped the length of the court, and floated in to score. He was no more excited than the Kansas fans who were beginning to suspect that, against all odds and all logic, the Jayhawks might upset the Sooners. 22 seconds before halftime, Oklahoma caught up. Ricky Grace, off balance, falling away, hitting the Sooners' sixth basket in their final eight shots of the half. It was Oklahoma's kind of half, a 100-point pace, but it was, surprisingly, all even. Oklahoma had lost only one game all year in which it had scored more than 80 points. And Kansas, even playing in its own backyard, knew that it would have to slow down the Sooners in the second half, especially after Manning picked up his third personal Oklahoma the opportunity to explode. Manning stayed in and Manning produced. He rebounded fiercely. He outscored everyone. He did everything but lead the cheer. Oklahoma clearly had the more balanced attack. Every man in the Sooners starting lineup scored in double figures. Stacy King wound up with 17. Still, Kansas held the Sooners to four points in the first four minutes after intermission. And when Manning hit his jump shot, the Jayhawks held a four point lead, 58-54. Then in the next four minutes, the momentum shifted. Oklahoma outscored Kansas 11 to two. When Mookie Blaylock broke free for a layup, Oklahoma coach Billy Chubbs could almost taste victory. The Sooners had never won an NCAA title, had reached the final four only twice, the last time in 1947. But when Stacy King's jump shot lifted Oklahoma into a five point lead with 12 minutes to play, the Sooners could hardly contain their excitement. Tubbs tried to calm his team down, but even he didn't suspect that King would not score another point, that the Sooners would manage only 14 points the rest of the game, only one point more than Manning scored during that time all by himself. The last quarter of the game was played at a pace Kansas dictated, a deliberate pace that conserved the Jayhawks' ebbing energy and disrupted the Sooners' rhythm. Oklahoma went almost five minutes without a field goal and took only three shots in that time. Manning, who never did pick up a fourth personal foul, who led all scorers with 31 points, clearly was in command. Newton, who wound up six for six, took only one shot in the second half. Kevin Pritchard, who wound up six for seven, made the shot that, with five and a half minutes to play, put Kansas in front for good starting a streak of six straight Kansas points. Manning contributed mightily at both ends of the court. He had two block shots, as well as five steals and 18 rebounds. Oklahoma's fans could see their dream of a national championship fading away for the second time in three months. Kansas, of course, had a rich basketball tradition, sprinkled with names such as Naismith, Fog Allen, Rupp, Chamberlain, and Dean Smith. But for this one night at least, Manning outshone them all. He gave Kansas a four-point lead. Then, with a little more than three minutes to go, Chris Piper, who, like Manning, went to Lawrence High School, gave Kansas a six-point lead, matching its biggest of the game. Now it was the KU fans who sensed victory. Oklahoma was struggling. Seeger went cold, missing four of five three-point attempts in the second half. But after five minutes without a Sooner field goal, Ricky Grace drove in for a layup that cut Kansas' lead to three points with less than a minute to play. Then Manning made one of his rare lapses, 
he missed the front end of a one in one foul situation. Oklahoma got the ball and Mookie Blaylock who had missed his two previous field goal attempts connected from the left side and suddenly it was a one point game with 40 seconds to go anyone's game. Kansas ran the clock down until Blaylock fouled Scooter Barry with 16 seconds to go. Barry made the first shot but missed the second. Manning a hero once more grabbed for the rebound and immediately drew a foul. If Manning could make both shots the game would almost be out of reach. He made the first and Kansas led by three. The crowd knew it was witnessing an historic end to a brilliant career. Manning made the second. Kansas led by four with only 14 seconds to play. Oklahoma had to score twice to get even or to win. The Jayhawks let Ricky Grace go all the way unmolested. His basket cut the margin to two points. Still seven seconds to go. If only the Jayhawks could get the ball safely in bounds, they would almost certainly win. They were smart. They got the ball to man. He was fouled. Made both shots. Put the game beyond reach with only five seconds to play. Just enough time for one last desperate shot. A shot that meant nothing even if it went in. It didn't. And the Kansas Jayhawks, the local heroes, were the NCAA basketball champions. The perfect climax to Danny Manning's four years of college stardom. They had finished no better than third in the Big Eight, but now they were number one in the nation. Kansas was king in Kansas City. Going to Kansas City, the story of the 1988 Final Four has been brought to you by Rawlings Sporting Goods Company, maker of the official ball of the 1988 NCAA Basketball Championships. This has been an NCAA Productions presentation.